I, I think what the working group three says is that it's possible if deep emission cuts are taking place in all the sectors. And what it also says is that it is feasible because of, of some of the cost cuts that have come across in renewable energy. I mean, solar, if you look at it, it's like a vertical line coming down in terms of how cheap solar has become. If there is a political will, we could still perhaps limit uh, to 1.5. But that window is very narrow, it's very short. And if we don't act now, then we, will, we are at a major risk of missing that brief window of opportunity. Does that line sound familiar? Yes, climate action is important and we need to act now. Stay tuned for an insightful conversation with one of the leading experts in the field. Hello and a big warm welcome to yet another episode on the Mission Junia podcast. Wherever you are, hope you are doing well and enjoying the season of life. Thanks for your feedback and ratings in the recent weeks. I really appreciate it. A couple of positive feedback have been for the cover arts. For that, I have to thank the friendly support of Jacob and team from TerraGeneration.com. Terra Generation is a content and marketing agency specialized in telling the stories of people and organizations working in climate and biodiversity conservation. Please do continue to support the show by sharing it in your network. Now on to this week's feature segment. We do feature the work of a range of sustainability entrepreneurs on the podcast, working on the big purpose and vision to get to the net zero carbon emissions. As an entrepreneur in this space, one thing that you need kind of a, like a good to have but not must have is validation. Validation of your idea and concurring with your premise that you are indeed working on something really big and impactful. In climate tech or let me use the other word planet positive that is the product and solutions working on climate action. So in the planet positive sector one of the best validations that you can get is from the reports and publications from the scientific community. Once every few years, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, produces seminal reports which change how the stakeholders with power and influence act on evidence. Over the last few months, the IPCC released reports from three working groups of the sixth assessment cycle, producing yet another round of solid evidence around climate change and in fact its impact and towards the end a bit of positive spin too with a conclusion that we can still stay within the 1.5 degree celsius limit if we double down on our efforts. I have always been fascinated with the massive amount of data that these reports put out. Each working group report runs a few thousand pages. So how are these reports prepared and presented? Like always, for every topic that we discuss on this podcast, we have a guest who has a significant experience in the topic and today's discussion is no different. So, who is our guest for today and why is her work very special to the topic we are going to discuss today? Hi, my name is Dr. Aditi Mukherjee and I work for the International Water Management Institute where I am a principal researcher. And I have been one of the coordinating lead authors in the IPCC Working Group 2 report as well that just came out recently in February 2022. So Aditi, I'm really excited to have you on the show because I was very curious. I mean, most of us are very curious about what goes behind the IPCC reports because once they are published, they are global headlines in the recent years. But before we get to that, you have been an expert in water sector for a long time. You have a PhD in the subject and you have worked on international projects and now you are currently based in India. So how did you get interested in the subject and what's your journey been like so far? Well, it's, 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 been, uh, it's been a long journey, 20 plus years now. Uh, and it all started with the first job I get, got after I finished my MPhil from uh, IIT Bombay. And I have, I started working with the International Water Management Institute. They had, they had, and they still have a small office in Anand, uh, in Gujarat. And there we, uh, and uh, there I started. I was a fresh graduate, not, not particularly, uh, 
keen on starting on water, but it was just one of my first jobs that I got. And uh, we started working, I used to work with the Professor Tushar Shah, and we started working on uh, things like groundwater. How do we manage India's groundwater economy? And it was just so fascinating that managing groundwater economy was so much less to do with the groundwater resource itself, Correct. but so much to do with the policies and the politics um, and the economics of it, the, just of sheer importance of social science. I, I'm a social scientist, a human geographer. And working, uh, my, my first job working the, uh, at, at IMI, um, just to see how important social sciences are for managing natural resources and groundwater being so critical, just got me hooked practically. Then I went on to do my PhD. I went to Cambridge. I also worked on related issues on groundwater and how does things like electricity or, or diesel prices affect farmers' access to groundwater. Then again, I started working with EMI. So it has been like my journey with water basically started 20 years ago when I started as a as a junior researcher at an EMI office in India. And after that, I have been uh, uh, working uh, in many places. I have had projects in Africa and Central Asia and India. Then I worked briefly with, with the mountain center in Kathmandu, Isi Mode, where I used to lead the water and air theme. There we worked on glaciers. We worked on mountain springs. And in each of it, uh, for me, the questions always has been, why do farmers do what they do? What, what in terms of water use? What, what, what motivates them to use water, to conserve water or not to conserve water? And what are those policy levers that are incentivizing farmers behavior? So that has been something that I have been very uniquely interested. So yeah, that's how, um, I, I came into water and stuck to it for the last 20 years now. Well. 20 years is a long time, but I'm sure all through it, the work has kept you excited because water is a crucial natural asset and the regions that you have worked, it's, I mean, water is a stressed asset in recent years. And I think that is why it's got more prominence in recent years. And that leads me to the origins of the IPCC reports. Can you give us a brief background about how the IPCC reports come about? We know that for every five to six years, there is a new set of working group assessment report that comes up. But from your perspective, how do these come up? So IPCC is an intergovernmental body, which is hosted by the uh, by the uh, United Nations Environment Program, UM, uh, UNEP, as well as WMO, World Meteorological Organization. And they started their assessments way back in 1990, when the first assessment report was published. And as you rightly say that every six to seven years, a new assessment cycle starts. So there is the IPCC Bureau and they uh, select authors uh, from various countries. So IPCC, uh, IPCC is um, where all the 198 countries are represented. So they try to get authors from all the member countries as far as possible. So IPCC has a very detailed procedure about how they uh, select their authors. So one of the procedures is that either the governments nominate authors, so a lot of the Indian authors or for that matter authors from various countries are nominated by the governments. Um, and then um, uh, and then there are also these other intergovernmental organizations that have nomination authorities. For example, I used to work with EC Mode, International Center for Integrated Mountain Development in Kathmandu. And it was at that time that EC Mode, which had the nominating authority, nominated my name. And once the IPCC Bureau gets all the names of authors and then they know what their chapter structure is, they kind of match the author competencies with what they require. Okay. Um, and in doing so, they have been also paying a lot of attention to diversity. So this assessment report, the sixth assessment report, I think all the working groups, especially working group two, of which I was involved in, has really made a lot of effort in getting a diverse group of authors so I think we are almost 50% from developing country, 50% from developed countries. We are, I think, 45% women scientists. The rest are men scientists. So, so there's been a lot of, uh, and then there are also uh, new people who come into IPCC. So there are new scientists who are doing IPCC for the first time. Some, somebody like me, this was my first cycle in AR6. I got involved. Uh, and then there are scientists who have been working from the previous assessment. So that's how the selection process happens. Basically, the governments or the nominating organizations nominate scientists. So there's a form that we fill up of short form with, with, uh, with our, you know, what our expertise is. 
And then the bureau members actually decide uh, who to invite based on their competencies and based on also this uh, making sure that diverse voices are included because, I mean, climate change affects us all. And this is a, this is where we, we need diverse voices to, to bring in the best of the science that there is. And just to be uh, clear that IPCC does not do new science. Our job is to assess the scientific literature that is already out there. So for us, for instance, we focused on assessing literature between 2014 to 2021. Uh, because um, because the last assessment kind of happened was published in 2014-15. So we looked at, at at scientific literature published after that for our assessment. Diversity is just, as you rightly mentioned, is a crucial factor in the sixth assessment cycle because I still re- remember a few names in the previous assessment and I don't think the diversity that you have in the sixth assessment was even 50% was there in the fifth ass- assessment. So that's a big shift and uh, it's interesting to see that a lot of things have been taken into consideration. Is it also related to, because between the fifth assessment and the sixth assessment, we had the big event of COP21, Paris Climate Agreement coming into force and things around that. Do you think that was a pivotal moment? Because at COP21, a big factor was a lot of countries, especially developing countries, underdeveloped countries, they felt they were not re- rightly represented. Was that a moment that the organization said, okay, let's be more diverse in the space? Uh, possibly, yes. Um, uh, I, I think there is also the overall discourse around decolonizing of knowledge. There is also this huge recognition that the climate crisis that we are in is also a part of the historical uh, historical uh, things like colonialism, for example, Colon- colonialism and new imperialism and things like industrialization. It's basically the kind of history of development that has brought us where we are today. And Working Group 2 report, for instance, also actually uses the word colonial histories as being one of those um, one of those things that have determined the current development trajectories that which has brought us to this current moment of of carbon emissions that we are seeing so i think overall in all in almost all sphere of research there is an increasing uh, increasing demand that diverse voices be given space because the climate crisis is just so complex and the climate crisis is pretty much the existential crisis for all of us that it is unrealistic to expect that unless those diverse voices are heard both in science but also in policy making that we would be able to solve such global problem so i do think that the paris agreement uh, uh, must have been a, a very big push towards uh, more diverse voices but also overall i see that happening in 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 more science and and then you see the organizations that are doing well scientifically or otherwise are also the, the organizations that are more diverse in their uh, in in the kind of voices that are heard, and I I personally felt that, and I have worked in many scientific organizations. I work with the international organization, and when I compare, I feel that IPCC has got some of these things really right. There is a there is a really diverse space where uh, where there is respect for diverse expertise and voices. So yes, I think diversity is absolutely yeah is very key. It's very key to if you have to solve complex problems. I mean, complex problems cannot be solved by just one group of people. Simply cannot be done. That is true. That is true, and that's a that's a good shift, in fact. And as you rightly said, a lot of uh, outcomes that we see from organizations is really turning to have better impact now, and probably diversity could be a key factor in that. Now, talking about the work, actually, there were three working groups and. Uh, Interestingly, I think even the IPCC reports have this structure when the first, you did mention that the overall thing is to look about the scientific evidence that has been published in the last few years. But then you put it out in three different groups, like looking at one, looking at the science, the second part, looking at the risks that could happen. And the third one is the possible solutions that could come about. So how, how does this three working groups function? Um, so these three working groups, uh, each of the working groups has its own, uh, they have their uh, chair, they have their uh, uh, co-chairs who lead the working group and then they have their own technical support unit and then they follow their own cycles. 
um, so each of these groups uh, have also also select their authors you know the author selection process i think remains more or less common that the authors are selected to contribute to working group 1 2 or 3 depending on their own background okay and uh, overall i think the overall ipcc bureau then uh, uh, then gives the timetable and these timetables are decided way in advance or where the how the working group one when the report will come uh, you, working group one the physical basis of climate change comes the first followed by working group two and three so these timelines are worked in 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 great detail and usually are and, and are always stuck to this time was a bit of an exception because everything was pushed by, back by say 6 months or so because of the pandemic but otherwise these are the decisions that are made quite early on at the beginning of the of the cycle so i would think that these decisions may have been made way back in 2015 or 16 Uh, about the composition of the working group the chapter structure and all these all the countries actually have also a role to play in the uh, in how those uh, chapter structures are done so they kind of give the very broad bullet points and those are our terms of reference as authors so the work, water chapter that i i led we had this broad structure and bullet points of the things that should be covered and we made sure that we tried to cover as much of that that was that was the you know wish list of the governments based on of course on what literature is available and what is not available and what happens at the end is uh, when all these reports so we have three working groups ipcc has three working groups but also then they they bring out special reports correct and uh, so the special reports uh, th- in this cycle ipcc brought out three special reports one on um, uh, limiting warming to 1.5 degree which is called sr 1.5 report then there was a report on land and then there was a report on on oceans and cryosphere and then there are these three working group reports so all these six products actually gets synthesized and gets published at the end of the cycle in the form of the synthesis report and that synthesis report will be released in in september this year Uh, and i'm all, i also happen to be a part of that work core work writing team of the synthesis report is a smaller team taken from all those uh, all the six reports we are a smaller body of authors but there the job of the synthesis report is to literally synthesize all the all the products that have come from the ipcc cycle in this case six reports have to be synthesized in a very very small summary document not exceeding uh, you know 10 12000 words for instance so these are very small concise ones very policy relevant ones that again gets approved by the governments so if um, yeah and and we we as scientists we of course do not speak on behalf of ipcc so we are all speaking uh, like we are writing the reports um, uh, and all that but uh, we are uh, how do i say we are not like we are not really part of ipcc that way so fair Uh, it's it's only the ipcc chairs vice chairs and the bureaus who speak for ipcc but our job is really scientific evaluation uh, and writing these reports oh that's fair now you did mention that scientists getting together on on such a big ty- topic a diverse set of scientists getting on this topic covid actually kind of delayed all the work that you we were conducting but how does these interactions ha- typically happen uh, as a lead author do you then divide the work among the other group members or how does this actually happen how do you synthesize data and how does that detailing happen yeah no that's a, that's a great question actually so what the ipcc bureau does it selects author team for each chapter and every chapter author team would have uh, at least two to three coordinating lead authors so they are and then it would have around 10 or so lead authors so the job of the coordinating lead authors is Uh, is to coordinate the chapter and i uh, was one of the coordinating lead authors for the water chapter and basically it is the job of the cla is to make sure that the chapter is actually written and delivered and it is the job of all the lead authors to ensure that uh, you know the sections that they are experts in to be written and delivered so basically the coordinating lead authors then put together all the sections and kind of you know uh, just help uh, coordinate the whole process so those are the 12 people that the ipcc bureau uh, selects and gives us a, 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 like we then become a team and then we work closely over the 3 years 
uh, we assign um, you know responsibilities we divide up the share of work so each one of us have certain specialization so we volunteer to write those sections but what has also happened over the years is that just the climate change literature has exploded i mean there is so much being written and there are just so many things it's just simply not possible for us to have expertise on everything we are still a small group of 12 authors correct so what we do is for the things where we feel that we do not have the expertise or we need external expertise we actually reach out to other experts and invite them to be contributing authors nice and my our chapter had almost 50 50 contributing authors who contributed some contributing authors may contribute a figure some may contribute a small section some may even contribute a one you know one critical paragraph and all them all of them gets named in the in in the report as 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 contributing authors the other two positions which are also very very crucial is something called a chapter scientist so chapter scientist is something that again we mostly the clas we we recruit from from among uh, interested uh, scientists mostly early career scientists and the chapter scientist then plays a lot of uh, help the coordinating lead authors and all the authors in in lot of um, how do i say lot of the smaller nitty gritties like maybe with the figures they they help with the references um uh, they help with with formatting and 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 lot of other things and they also almost always become contributing authors and yeah so that's pretty much it and then there are two more official members of the chapter team and those are the review editors review editors are very senior uh, mostly senior people who are uh, whose job is to make sure that the chapter uh, chapter authors are responding to each and every expert comment that we receive so the ipcc chapters go through um three rounds of review uh, of which two rounds are expert review plus one round is a government review and we have to respond to each and every review comments the, uh, so uh, the review editor's job is to make sure that the integrity of those review is maintained and they often provide um, you know valuable advice so we had two very senior review editors as a part of our team as well so i hope that clarifies to sum up there would be coordinating lead authors who coordinate lead authors who write chunks of the chapters they take help from contributing authors which the lead authors themselves can can bring on board there are chapter scientists who work closely with the coordinating lead authors and there are review editors yes yeah it sounds a lot but but it it works out it's a lot of work but 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 it's also wonderful to be collaborating with scientists from all over exactly i mean it's a wonderful way to collaborate on such a massive project but as a lead author there are other challenges as well i'm sure like just like a corporate environment where you have experts le- leaders in their own right coming together there are frictions also coming up especially in the scientific community i'm sure when you have to publish a big chapter that is going to have a big impact across countries there must be a lot of frictions also that come up that you as a lead author should would have handled can you show sure through some insights on that I mean you know what I think we were incredibly lucky we had this amazing chapter team we had I mean one of the challenges that often happens is one of your lead authors isn't really contributing all that much and then there is a huge process of of you know replacing that lead author um thankfully for our chapter more or less we had good contributions from all the lead authors but it also means that uh, the coordinating lead authors have to be also on the on a bit of a top of their game Uh, um uh, and 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 do the coordination well hold regular meetings have very clear you know roles and responsibilities and what i have found is just the sheer level of commitment among i think it's not only my chapter but the entire report just when scientists have been uh, selected for one more all of us have volunteered right i mean nobody has forced us to uh, as to put our name for ipcc so that way we have all volunteered we have all are very highly motivated so i think that high degree of motivation really comes to play and correct um personally there wasn't a single struggle that i thought that we went through we were always able to produce uh, reasonable drafts within within the deadlines but provided that we we keep doing the coordination well keep following up uh, and and all of that that's really great but then it allowed you to focus on the bigger challenge that was kind of in the sixth assessment the a lot of focus was on the developing countries and climate risk so how did you go about assessing them and what was the kind of general feedback from your chapter 
so uh, because we do this assessment based on literature um, one of the major assessments that we did uh, in the working group 2 was around adaptation so unlike working group 1 and working group 3 where they have like scenarios and models working group 2 which is around adaptation vulnerability there aren't those kind of models that are you know uh, talking about uh, uh, adaptation so it's 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 a different nature of literature these are also more social science more qualitative um a case study based so uh, i mean assessment happens in 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 various ways but one of one part of the assessment that i wanted to talk about to, today for example was the adaptation uh, global adaptation assessment that happened and there was a database created called gami global adaptation mapping initiative where over 1800 or so papers published between 2014 and 2020 um uh, that looked at uh, you know adap- uh, implemented adaptation measures in various countries in peer reviewed literature so that database was prepared and most of the uh, by prepared by one one group uh, who were working with ipcc but they were also kind of also independent group of of uh, of academics from all over and we used that database uh, and in the water chapter what we did was because we were interested in water related adaptation so within from that database we we selected studies that were looking at water related adaptation which we which we defined as adaptations which were either happening in response to water related hazards be it floods or droughts or you know rainfall variability or adaptation where the response was water for example irrigation rainwater harvesting etc cetera, etc cetera. so we then created a database and we were also interested in our chapter to know are those effective in reducing climate risk so we also then zeroed in on studies within that larger database that looks at outcomes of adaptation so by that i think we had around 359 360 studies that met our inclusion criteria okay and then we would kind of you know go and code each of those studies across a, a, a uniform coding protocol using uh, some kind of a meta review technique and um, and that's how we kind of you know came to some of our adaptation related uh, conclusions but overall this is the way you would gather literature and then kind of assess that literature to find out uh, what exactly is is happening and you could either do formal coding the way we did or or you could do also literature scanning and scoping review so so a, a whole lot of assessment techniques are used in the in the whole report that's good but the crucial part the part that every everyone is kind of very interested is kind of the final output that comes so it's a lot of information processing that you do but when whatever you release those are like global headlines right from the word go so how do you get to that final part of conclusion even i think the recent one the third assessment report a uh, third working group report was kind of delayed because there was a lot of back and forth discussions on the final conclusions so how do you get there eventually combining all the chapters in the report yeah no that's an excellent question so the only part of the report that the governments actually have a say on is the summary for policy makers so the summary of policy makers is a co-produced document between the scientists and the policy makers okay so the sequence is this first we write all our chapters working group 2 had 18 chapters so every chapter had its chapter team like i explained earlier so we finish writing that report and sometimes during the seg- between the first and the second draft we as a team and mostly the coordinating lead authors but also some selected lead authors become a part of this another team called technical summary okay uh, and a summary for policy makers so the technical summary is um, is where uh, all these 18 chapters in our case are summarized but they are not summarized like you know chapter by chapter obviously they are summarized more like in a, in a, in a thematic wise correct for example the, our structure was we we kind of summarize them based on um, the current risks so all the observed risk in the various sectors were summarized in one section followed by all the projected risks in the future summarized in another section and so that's what the technical uh, technical summary is the technical summary is something that the scientists do it gets reviewed by the governments as i said we have three rounds of reviews which is open to and my chapter i think we got 5000 reviews overall i i don't even know how many reviews maybe 60 70000 review comments come in it's a massive and we have to reply to all of them and all those replies would be on the public domain 
Okay. Um, so yeah. Anyway, so the, after we do the technical summary and the summary for policymakers happen side by side. In the summary for policymakers, the co-chairs of the working group they play a lead role, and they are in that sense the coordinating lead authors of those of those summary products. Uh, and the summary product, the summary for policymaker is a relatively short document. And when you see about IPCC approval, the approval that is happening is that document, that one document among all the ones. Okay. That is the shorter summary for policymakers, where some policymakers go through line by line, approving or suggesting changes uh, in in that summary, and then the scientists come in to say that if those changes in words are still are still uh, true to science, so we still get to say that no, if you change it that way, that isn't what our scientific assessment is saying, and the governments would have to then uh, kind of reconsider their comments that way. Or if you think the suggestion that the governments are making are compatible with science, with just some tweak of words, we are still getting, you know, the science remains, uh, the, our assessment, underlying assessment is fine, uh, then uh, we kind of agree. So it's, it's, it's like a, con it's a negotiation process between the scientists and the government. Uh, yeah, and uh, because it's, it's a co-produced document. It's interesting. I have... I didn't know that. I'm sure a lot of uh, listeners will also probably not be aware of that. Are all the governments involved, like all the 190 plus member countries involved in this process? Yes, 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 yes. They would they would send representatives. All the governments would have representatives sent to them. Uh, send uh, all or all, at least all the major ones would have representatives. Uh, and and each one could have a delegation. Some would have a delegation of, you know, any, any time between whatever two to... 10, 15, even from one country. And they all go line by line. Yes. So yes, the answer is yes. Everybody participates. Do, did you have any tough uh, job uh, during the final phases of the working group too? I think what happens is that uh, because each of the governments and each of their national realities are quite different. So uh, everybody wants to see their national realities reflected in the report. But very early on, the report also decided that uh, it, it isn't really about so much national reality, but it focuses more on the regional and the global. So I think there is a bit of a tension there. For instance, he would say something around and then the other, some country may say, but that's not valid for my country. But if it's, if it's valid, you know, overall for the region, overall for the, for the, for the, for the uh, global level, it still holds. So um, it's yeah. I mean, uh, there there are there are moments when there are you know deep disagreements between the governments, and many of the times it's not really among scientists and the governments. It's actually governments and governments. I mean, <laughs> obviously you know how contentious the, the the climate negotiations are. So many of the points of differences are not so much about us, but it's about the governments and their varying national positions. So yeah, I know it's fraught with interesting moments and a huge learning opportunity for us scientists well, who may or may not have been a part of, uh, you know, political negotiation before. Well, Aditi, on that uh, note, I would like to finally ask you this question, uh, especially on the sixth assessment. Now, the recent report, the working group uh, three report was also out and it has like a few lines of positivity in saying that it is possible, there are solutions available, but from the scientific uh, community from the scientist from your view do you think all the evidences that you have is it justified to conclude that yes we have the required resources to kind of limit the temperature rise to keep our aspirational target of 1.5 degrees celsius is it still possible i i think uh, what the working group three says is that it's possible if deep emission cuts are taking place in all the sectors and what it also says is that it is feasible because of, of some of the cost cuts that have come across in renewable energy. I mean, solar, if you look at it, it's like a vertical line coming down in terms of how cheap solar has become. Correct. So uh, I feel uh, what these assessments actually are showing that uh, if there is a political will, there is still, we are still within, uh, we could still perhaps uh, limit uh, to 1.5. But it's, it's becoming, but the, but that window is very narrow, is very short. And if we don't act now, then we will, we are at a major risk of missing that brief window of opportunity. Fair. No, that, the line that you mentioned, that uh, the narrow window of opportunity, well, although that is there in the final report, but generally when the headlines are there, it's 
a little optimistic headline, but that is also good in a way that she says like the scientific community believes that it is possible. But yes, the window of opportunity is very short, very narrow. So, and it's shrinking very fast. <laughs> True, uh, that is a missing piece as well. Well, Aditi, it's been an absolute pleasure. I mean, a lot of things that you kind of mentioned. Uh, I am sure, like a lot of us, would never get into the details of understanding how a massive report comes out. All that we look at is like the headlines that are out in the media, and few of us who are interested would probably get into the. summary for policy makers a few of us would probably look at the figures that come in the technical summary the figures and graphs but no one would go to in depth in 3000 4000 pages document that together comes out but uh, yeah it's a lot of process a lot of activities that go behind the scenes and uh, it was really wonderful having this conversation with you to kind of understand what really goes behind the scenes and it was very insightful so thank you very much for taking time to join me on the podcast and share this story and your experience in working on in this report thank you so much girish for having it it was a pleasure i found this conversation very insightful but it's also because i have been following the work of aditi for a long time now and i can really understand the amount of passion that she brings into her work so a few years down the line If we come across yet another IPCC report, well, you now know the amount and type of work that could have gone in producing that. As an eternal optimist, I hope the scientific community continues to find consistent data to validate and possibly nudge us towards the path of 1.5 degrees C. Until then, let's continue to do our bit in whatever ways we can. You can follow Aditi's work on Twitter. I will leave the links in the show notes as usual. And while you're on Twitter, you can also follow Mission Chunia. The handle is at Mission Chunia. And if you prefer to write me an email, Mission Chunia at gmail dot com is the ID. So with that, I will be back in two weeks' time with yet another insightful conversation. Until then, this is Girish Shivakumar signing off. And as always, thank you for listening.